Thank you very much, Randy. Our next presenter, and she's pulling her slides up now, is Miranda Kirsten. Miranda, well, first of all, I'm Marisa, Marisa Thompson, and I'm on the board also. I'm the vice president of Think Trees, and I also am with New Mexico State University Cooperative Extension. I'm the urban horticulture specialist based in Las Lunas, and I get to work with Miranda. So Miranda is also with NMSU. She's in the Integrated Pest Management Program since 2018, focusing on pollinator and beneficial insect conservation. Miranda received her master's in integrative biology from Oklahoma State University and bachelor's in environmental science, policy, and management from the University of Minnesota. Yeah, and this is uh, one of the presentations that is eligible for NMDA CEUs. So I'm going to just now start passing around. There'll be a couple of the rosters for people who need NMDA CEUs to fill out. Online, we're tracking attendance using Zoom, so you won't have to do the roster for NMDA. And um, I think that's our announcement for, yeah. Yeah, and for ISA, there's going to, just like this code you're seeing now, at the end of Miranda's talk, there'll be another code to get the ISA uh, credits. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Miranda. Thank you, Marisa. So, um, yeah, so I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with many of the insect pests that are out there, and I know there's going to be a few talks on those today, but I'm here to talk about all of the benefits that we get from insects and help you to kind of learn what some of those beneficial insects are that you might see. Um, so first of all, just tying into the theme of the conference, insects do contribute to resilient in ecosystems. So insects and other invertebrates, are, represent a vast majority of all described species worldwide. And really, most insects are either beneficial or don't cause harm to us. And we actually really need them for our food webs and our natural systems. Um, the thing is that diversity is key. Um, so in healthy ecosystems, a lot of our good bugs are taking care of our pest. Um, so let's go over some of the ecosystem services though that insects give us. So the first one is going to be pollination. So over 80% of our plants are pollinated by animals. Most of those are insects. 30% of the food that we eat relies on insect pollinators to get um, for those plants to produce fruits and seeds. Um, these pollinators are also, not only are the insects food for wildlife, but the fruits that they're helping to create are food for wildlife. And we also need our insect pollinators to help promote our native plant diversity. The next one is going to be um, natural pest control. So our natural enemies, we'll talk more about these in detail, are also important components of our ecosystem. If you're using um, integrated pest management for pest control, um, this is often referred to as biological control, which is just the use of these living organisms to help control the unwanted species. Insects are also very important in our food webs. So they're the base of most food webs and food chains. Um, because many of them are eating on plant material, they're helping to convert that plant material into something that other animals can eat. Um, and insects are food for many birds, mammals, reptiles, spiders, fish, and even, even other insects. Um, so these pictures just show some um, insectivorous birds and lizards. Um, insects also help with decomposition and nutrient cycling. So there are some that help to break down organic material. This can be plant material, other organic waste. Um, this photo sh shows the germistid beetles eating a carcass. Um, so these insects that do that help break down things. This helps with, with nutrient cycling and also helps make these nutrients available for plant growth. And many of these insects we actually don't know are out there because they're so small that we can't really see them. And the same um, goes with soil health. So there's a lot of insects that live in the soil. Some of them are burrowing, um, helping to aerate the soil. Um, some of them are helping to recycle nutrients through the system. And then um, the last benefit I'll talk about, I guess, is twofold with seeds. 
Um, so some insects help with seed dispersal. This can be a problem if you're trying to, uh, I tried to put seeds in my yard and the ants moved them all to their nest. But in some systems, that's really helpful and the ants help to move seeds around and get, um, get our you know, systems going. Um, and some insects also eat seeds. So um, these two pictures show a milkweed bug and another seed eating bug. But other insects will help with weed control. Like some eat ragweed and pigweed seeds. So they're also out there helping us out and helping with weed control. Now, I will acknowledge that insects also can cause harm. So some are major agricultural pests. So, you know, some are landscape and ornamental pests, some vector diseases, and then some are parasites. But many of these pests would be harder to manage if we didn't have our insect predators and other natural enemies out there helping to manage them. So before we get into kind of the details of our different insects, just wanted to briefly go over the two types of life cycles that insects undergo because we're going to talk about um, some of the different stages with some of the examples. So some of our insects, um, picture on the left here, go through complete metamorphosis. So with complete metamorphosis, we have four distinct life stages. The example here is the butterfly. Starts with an egg. The larval stage often looks different. It looks different than the adult stage. The food source may be different than what the adults eat. Um, these insects will then go into a pupa so that they can completely change into the adult stage. So in this case, the butterfly, um, which will feed on nectar. The right shows the insects that go through incomplete metamorphosis. Um, so with these, the uh, it also starts with an egg, but the nymphs will look similar to the adults. They will, they don't have wings, um, but in a lot of cases you'll be able to tell what they are at least because they look, look like the older one. And then the adults will often have wings. Okay. So I'm though, although insects do have a lot of benefits, I work with the natural enemies and pollinators. So I'm going to go into calling it a sampling of them because there's so many more than what I'm going to talk about. I just pick some of my, some of my favorite. So to start with some definitions for natural enemies though. So a natural enemy is just an organism that kills, injures, or reduces the fitness of insect pests. Fitness just refers to the reproductive health. Then we'll have predators. So those are going to be insects or other insect eating animals that will eat insect prey. We have parasitoids. Those are the larval stages of adult parasites that feed on or inside insects. So the difference between a parasite and a parasitoid is that a parasitoid will kill its host. So in the case of insects, these parasitoids are going to be um, wasps or flies. And then um, we won't talk about pathogens, but pathogens are another form of natural enemies. So those are going to be viruses, bacteria, fungi and other microorganisms that can cause disease because those can be helpful um, in controlling pests. So let's get into our insects. The first one I wanted to talk about are beetles. So some beetles do eat plants, but we're going to focus more on those that are pollinators and natural enemies. So beetles, um, here's four examples of beetles that um, are both, both pollen, some eat pollen, some uh, eat pests, um, but beetles have chewing mouth parts, um, and then they also have elytra on their back, so they, they are hardened wings that you'll be able to see. Um, one thing to also notice with beetles, some of them do have pollen on them, but they don't have hairs to help them collect the pollen, uh, but they can be important pollinators. It's thought that ev if you go way back evolutionarily, that beetles were the first insect pollinators, actually. So beetles go through that complete metamorphosis. So the larval stage, or sometimes called the grub, looks completely different than the adult stage. So the larval stage will have strong jaws because they um, are designed to chew. So they're either chewing insect prey or sometimes wood um, or other plant material. Um, as you can see on this top one, which is a ladybug, they have three pairs of segmented walking legs. This bottom picture shows the uh, larval stage of the June beetle, which you'll find underground. So they're pale colored, creamy white. The legs are a little harder to see, but if you look closely, 
you can see that they do have those three pairs of legs in them. Um, so really those grubs that are helping decompose, so still, still beneficial. I find them in my compost sometimes. Just to compare, I just decided to put um, two species of uh, beetles that are eating plant material. So the left here shows the elm leaf beetle, the larval stage of that. The right shows um, larvae and an adult of the cottonwood leaf beetle. So you can see they are kind of similar to those lady big larvae, but there's coloration differences. Um, you'll see more, oops, sorry, more of the um, herbivorous ones to gathering together sometimes. You can also see they're actually eating the leaf, whereas if it's a predatory insect, it will not be. So sometimes uh, people do mistake the lady, uh, ladybug larva for a pest, since it does look very different than the adults. Um, so we'll just, uh, the bottom picture here, again, shows that ladybug larva. They are wonderful predators. They eat lots of aphids, uh, for the most part. Um, they can crawl all over plants looking for food. And they're generally this elongated shape, darker color, and then depending on the species, we'll have different combinations of orange, reds, and blacks. Uh, the top photo here shows the ladybug eggs, because you'll often find those on plants, usually near their insect pest, but they're just yellow cylindrical eggs. Here's just some examples of lady beetles that you might see here in New Mexico. Um, luckily, a lot of them are named for what they look like. So, the two-spotted lady beetle has two spots on it. The parentheses lady beetle has parentheses on it. Um, the convergent lady beetle is very common, um, so you'll probably see, you might see a lot of those, maybe even aggregations of those. Um, the twice stab lady beetle is black, looks like someone stabbed it twice. Uh, the seven-spotted lady beetle has seven spots on it, so you see where we're, go <laughs> where we're going with this. And then uh, the multicolored lady beetle, so that and the seven-spotted lady beetle are actually introduced species. Um, the multicolored lady beetle, um, as Marisa said, I went to the University of Minnesota. We said there was an upside-down M on the head. It could also be a W, but... Uh, that's what we said there. So some of the ladybugs that you might see out and about. And then I just wanted to focus on two kind of, um, that eat more of the tree pests. So the twice stab lady beetle feeds on armored scales. Uh, the left picture here shows the, the larval stage. It does look a little different than the other ladybug larva picture I showed. So just wanted to show that. And then the pupa in this middle picture here with that adult in the middle. They're actually kind of diamond shaped black and scaly. So if you see those on a tree, those are good. Uh, they're the, they're going to turn into that adult with the twice stab, the two stabs on it, um, and help eat scales. And then the right picture just shows two adults kind of hiding in the wood there. And then the other one that doesn't, the adults don't look like the other lady beetles really, is the mealybug dest uh, destroyer. So this is actually an introduced species, but it feeds on mealybugs and other scale insects and even some aphids. Um, so the larva, which you can see on the left there, kind of looks like a mealybug, um, which is on the left of the left picture. Um, but they move faster, they have those longer um, filaments on it, and they actually grow to twice the size of a mealybug. And then the adults on the right here, also feeding on a mealybug. Um, so they're actually pretty small, only an eighth of a, to a sixth of an inch, um, but you might see those out um, eating plant, or eating mealybugs on plants. Uh, the next beetle I wanted to talk about is the checkered beetle. Um, so these are mostly predators of bark beetles and other wood-boring beetles. Um, so you actually really won't see the larva of these ones because they're gonna be in the tunnels that bark beetles form. Um, but the adults, uh, these pictures show a couple of examples of what the adults look like. Um, you can find those on dead tree trunks or logs. They might be searching for food or sites to lay their eggs, but they also visit flowers frequently. Um, so these checkered beetles, as you can see, have bright color patterns on them. Uh, they have rectangular heads, and then these photos are maybe a little hard to see, but they have a clubbed antenna on them, so that can help you distinguish them from other beetles. Uh, 
the next one is the soft wing flower beetles. So these ones you'll commonly see feeding on pollen. Some of the adults are also predatory, so they'll eat insect larvae, aphids, and other insects, um, but they also uh, like, feed on pollen. Um, it's thought that the larvae are predators that live in the soil, but it's, uh, I guess people haven't found a lot of the larval stage either. Um, but these ones have very, uh, it's hard to see on these uh, pictures, but also very kind of distinct antenna. Um, and then their wings don't cover the back of the abdomen completely. So those ones are kind of fun to find. Uh, the next group are true bugs. So true bugs have piercing, sucking mouth parts. Some species use those to feed on plant material. Other species use those to eat other insects. Um, so in these photos here, uh, this top green one uh, does eat plants, uh, but these, uh, the center and bottom ones eat other insects. Um, so true bugs um, can be identified uh, by their, their, they have a pair of wings that are half leathery and half membranous. So you can see that on the bottom here. Several of them have kind of an X on the back. So you have to look kind of closely, maybe like close your eyes a little bit to make it an X. And then they go through that incomplete metamorphosis. So the juveniles will look similar to the adults, but lack wings. So a big group of uh, predatory true bugs are going to be the assassin bugs. They are generalist predators. They'll eat anything they can catch. They'll eat each other. They're named assassin bugs because they use their mouth part to stab their prey and then suck out the insides of them. Um, so these two do have insect prey. Unfortunately, they sometimes will eat other beneficial insects, like I said. So this one on the left here has a bee. Um, you might also see them on flowers drinking nectar. Um, so they will overwinter in many life stages, kind of in protected areas. So something to think about as you're you know, working in the landscape. Um, one thing I've had, I personally have had a problem mistaking assassin bugs with is the leaf-footed bug. So I just wanted to pull these two up to compare. So the picture on the left here shows an assassin bu bug. Um, it's, it's a species that occurs in the eastern U.S., so not here. It unfortunately grabbed a honeybee. Um, and then the two, the middle and the right, show the leaf-footed plant bugs. So if you look at the legs, you'll see that the leaf-footed bugs have that flattened hind leg region that the assassin bug doesn't have. You might also see, like the picture on the right, just large ag aggregations of these plant bugs. You're not going to really see that of the predatory species. The next true bug is very small, so these are minute pirate bugs. Um, this top picture here shows it in the by a coreopsis flower. So if you think of what the inside of that flower looks like, you can see how small that that bug is. Um, but minute pirate bugs, great predators of small soft-bodied insects. You might also see adults on the flowers um, because they supplement their diet with pollen and nectar. Um, they actually overwinter as the adult stage, also in leaf litter, also might be found under bark, and the eggs will be laid there as well. So um, these are pretty common to find in yards and gardens. Um, but if you can, see, so you can start to train your eye to see them. Um, but they do have that cone-shaped head still. They have bulging eyes. And then the most distinguishable part, part of them is that they have that uh, kind of that, the black and white X on their, on their abdomen. They will also have had them kind of bite. I've had them notice they're on me because they have bitten me. Um, so if you're trying to distinguish if it's a beetle or a true bug, here's just a few a few ideas for you, um, and just kind of showing the differences between the two because sometimes they can look similar. Um, so beetles have chewing mouth parts, whereas those true bugs have piercing sucking mouth parts. Um, beetles have um, the elytra, so those hardened wings, um, covering their second set of wings, whereas the true bugs have those wing tips. And then beetles go through complete metamorphosis, whereas the true bugs go through incomplete metamorphosis. Uh, the next set of insects are our flies. Um, so f all flies have a single pair of wings, so just two wings, um, some, uh, as opposed to the ones that have four. Flies also have short, stubby antennas, as you can see with this uh, fly on the top here. Um, large eyes, um, as you can see on both sides, a rubber fly on the bottom. 
And then some flies have sponging sucking mouth parts, but others have piercing sucking mouth parts. So again, flies are another where they can have different roles, but we'll just talk about the beneficial ones. So flies also go through that complete metamorphosis, so the larva stage looks completely different. Um, the top here shows a surfeit fly larva, the bottom a tachinid fly larva. So these don't have legs, they also lack a distinct head area. Um, so if you think kind of like maggots you find sometimes. Um, the head end is often tapered to a point, um, and it, they're, you can't really see, but there might be a pair of tiny hooks that are normally retracted. And then they might have um, a pair of eye-like spiracles at the hind end. Um, but the main thing is that they don't have legs or the head, head region. So with surfeit flies, that larval stage is an important predator of aphids, scale insects, and other soft-bodied insects. But they're often unnoticed because they're slow-moving and they blend in well with the plants. Um, adults, um, as these two examples here, they are not predators, they're only pollinators, and they actually can be very important pollinators in systems. So you might see adults feeding on pollen and nectar on flowers. Um, so depending on the species, they might overwinter as pupa or adults in the leaf litter or the soil, and then the eggs will be laid near the play, uh, its prey. So um, these surfeit flies, you might also know them as hoverflies because you'll see them um, hovering around flowers um, but these fly, flies, you can't, they have kind of shiny, kind of shiny wings. There's a, a spurious vein that's hard to see on there, and then large eyes and short antennas. So these also will mimic bees, um, so they're often confused between the two. Next flies are going to be our tachinid flies. So these are, these are an example of parasitoids. So the larval hosts for these are going to be... Um, Things like caterpillars, grasshoppers, beetle larvae, tree bugs. Um, it kind of depends. Some species are generalists and will attack a wide variety of hosts, while others are more specialists. So they'll just um, attack um, a certain either species or family. Um, so this picture on the top here uh, shows so a monarch caterpillar had gone to make its gone to go into its chrysalis. So it was in the J form. Um, unfortunately, it had a tachinid fly uh, growing inside of it, so that, that fly killed it um, as it was coming out. So if you see, um, in this case, if you might see caterpillars or chrysal chrysalids hanging with a string coming out of it, and that means a tachinid fly came out of it. Um, so the adults are just, they're you know, flies. Um, some are kind of interesting flies. Um, they feed on nectar and honeydew. Some are also very important pollinators, especially in high elevations. Um, some can look kind of like houseflies. I'd pick two of the more interesting looking ones here. Um, so some tachinid flies will actually overwinter within their host. Um, some, will, some will overwinter within their host, host pupa and then come out, and some will come out and pupate on its own. So it's kind of a fascinating interaction that can, can occur. And then depending on the species, some of them will lay an egg on the, the host, or some of them will lay it near it, and then when they hatch, they'll find their host. Okay, so we'll switch over then to lace wings. Um, so lace wings are also another generalist predator. Um, you'll probably see the up, so the upper left picture here is an egg, uh, most likely, so that's the main sign of that there's lace wings present. Um, so these eggs are laid on a stalk, and they either will be laid singly or in groups near the insect prey, and they are laid on that stalk so that the first one that hatches doesn't eat the other eggs. It's kind of an interesting adaptation they have. Um, this, the upper right picture shows the lace wing larva. So again, going through you know, that different different kind of metamorphosis. So larvas are important predators, sometimes called aphid lions, because they can eat so many aphids. Um, the adults seen here on the bottom, they're called lacewing because they have long lacy wings. Um, so they, you, some are predators, but you'll also see them feeding on pollen, nectar, and honeydew, or just hiding kind of in the plant foliage. So these ones also will overwinter in leaf litter. Um, or as a cocoon in, in the leaf. 
And then the final, I believe, the final group we're going to talk about is the Hymenoptera. So those are going to be the bees, wasps, and then I'm just going to mention ants here, um, but we won't go into those. So bees are very important for our pollinator services. Um, wasps are also pollinators, but important for biological control. And then ants um, help with soil structure, nutrient recycling, and seed dispersal. So Hymenoptera are very, a very important order within our systems. Um, Hymenoptera also go through that complete metamorphosis, so you're not likely to see the larval stage of, of many of them because they're within nester colonies or within plant galls. Um, but this upper picture here shows honeybee larva, so within the uh, hive, that's what it looks like. And then the bottom picture is um, a stem nesting bee. And I can't remember which one it was. Um, but they're often underground in the nest, so they're going to be pale colored with very little pig pigmentation. And it does have a head region, but they're hard to, hard to distinguish since it looks like the rest of it. Um, I did pull up two of the um, hymenopteran larvae that are out, out and about <laughs> eating plant material that can look like caterpillars. Um, so this is an example of a saw fly. Um, so those are leaf feeding. Um, they look like moth and butterfly. Oh, sorry. So they're often called caterpillars, but they have, um, if you can see here, those middle legs are called pro legs. They have six to eight pairs of those pro legs um, within their body. So if you if you start counting those, you can determine if it's a sawfly versus a moth or butterfly caterpillar. Um, this one I just thought was interesting. So this is an example of an hor a horn tail. Um, someone found this in. Um, a sage, Artemisia, up near the Farmington area. Um, and they weren't sure what it was, so they were, they were pulling plants and these uh, larvae came out, larva came out. So the horntails do eat plant material um, and they have retractable jaws. They don't really have legs. And then these ones have a, a little horn on the end. Um, just to show how this compare though, here's just some examples of butterfly and moth larva. So, um, if you kind of look closely near the head, you can see that there's three pairs of legs on the butterfly and moth caterpillars. And then in the middle is two to five pairs of the pro legs in it. And then on that pro leg, they have little hooks um, that you can't see in these pictures, but that are, that are there. So if you're wondering if it's a caterpillar, hymenoptera, you can look at them that way. So with the adults, um, we'll first talk about bees. So bees are the only animal that purposefully collects pollen. They're the only ones that feed it to that larval stage, so the only insect that relies on it for all of its life cycle. So within the US, there's 4,000 different species. Here in New Mexico, we have over 1,000 species of native bees. And like I said, they're the most efficient pollinators because of larval food, and they practice uh, sometimes floral constancy, so they'll move to flowers of the same species. Um, these pictures just show some of the bees that we have, some of the mini bees that we have around here. So these bees have two different types of behaviors. Solitary bees will, which are most of them, will lay eggs. Uh, the female will lay eggs in the nest. She'll leave it a little um, pollen ball and then leave. Um, and then the youth social, our social bees, are going to watch over the young. These are ones that are going to have more of a hive with a queen. They're taking care of the young, feeding them as they grow up. Um, and then we have two main types of nesting with our bees. So 70% of our bees actually nest in the ground. Uh, these are some examples of those. Um, so you might see, if you see holes in the ground, you know, just watch to see what's happening, and you might see a bee coming in or out of it. Um, so these are going to be individual nests, but if there's a nice site, they will, it might share an area, so you might see more than one together. And then the rest of bees, uh, so the other 30% nest in cavities. So this could be in old woods in the hole, in, in old holes in wood, in loose bark, um, in stone crevices. Some bees will excavate those and these stem nesting bees are when you see um, kind of the man-made nest where we either put bundles of bamboo together or drill holes into lo the logs. Those are the stem nesting bees. 
And then on this top uh, left picture, you'll see the circular cut on the chili plant. So that's from the leaf cutter bee. So they cut circles out of their leaves, out of leaves to make their nests. So you might see those on different plants while you're out. I also just wanted to bring up cuckoo bees because I find them interesting. So these are kleptoparasites. They look different from other bees because they don't have pollen collecting, hair, pollen collecting hairs because the females of these bees um, lay their eggs in other bees' nests. So the top row of these pictures show different examples of cuckoo bees. Um, here in the Albuquerque area, and then the bottom picture shows examples of their host. So it's actually good to see there's cuckoo bees out and about because their presence signifies that their host populations are healthy enough to support them. So there's some parasitism going on within the same order. Um, one of the eustachial bees that I wanted to talk about are bumblebees because they're the large bees we'll see about very frequently. So bumblebees are going to be, they're actually um, active at some of the coolest temperatures. So you might see them in the early spring um, or late fall. Those will often be the queen bees, which is bottom picture here is a queen bumblebee. They're going to be the very, if you see a very large bumblebee, that's a queen bee. In the summer, we'll see worker bees. So those are going to be smaller, it's kind of smaller looking bumblebees. Um, and then bumblebees will actually nest kind of in our in abandoned rodent burrows or in uh, bunch grasses. Um, so if you see bee activity around there, it's good to leave them out or leave that protected. Um, I thought I'd talk about carpenter bees here a little bit because they do nest in wood and you know, depending on where their nest is, they could be considered a pest. Um, so carpenter bees look like bumblebees, uh, but they have fewer hairs. So I did pick two examples of species on the right here that are all black. Um, unlike bumblebees, carpenter bees are solitary, um, but there might be nests that are close. So the picture on the left here is a, an old tree that had a carpenter bee, a lot of carpenter bees nesting in it, so it was moved. Um, someone had it moved so that those could be protected. Um, but yeah, just remember wherever they are, um, I was at my, my grandparents and I saw a carpenter bee going into their pergola and my grandpa went and pulled out the raid and I had to scold them for that. So remember, I, it, part of it depends on where they're at. <laughs> and then the last bee I thought I'd touch on is just the honeybee since it's you know, very common around here. So honeybees are cavity nesters. They're one of our managed species. They differ from uh, wild bees that we have here in, in a few key ways. So they're social. There's a queen and workers that live together in a hive. They have far more bees in one hive than like bumblebees do. Um, they produce large amounts of honey, which we use for our, our benefit as well, since we can collect it and eat it. And then with honeybees, their activity is based on temperature. So whenever it's over about 55, you'll probably see honeybees out and about. I actually saw some in the last couple of weeks in my yard on the, on the mustard. So. Sometimes you don't know what they're feeding on, but the temperature is right. You may also come across a honeybee swarm. So that's when you see the group of honeybees together, sometimes on a branch. So this is just a method that the, they use uh, for colonies to reproduce. So when a honeybee swarms, the, the old queen bee and about half of the worker bees will leave their nest to find a new home. And this usually will occur in the spring. So They'll, they may gather on branches and then move on. Um, if you do find a swarm, there are resources. The Albuquerque beekeepers have resources on people you can call to come gather those bees for you. Uh, so something to keep in mind if you are, are fortunate enough to come across a swarming, depending on how you feel about it. Um, I also wanted to talk about wasps because I think a lot of times we think about yellow jackets and wasps that we maybe don't like as much. Uh, but a lot of wasps are actually kind of, they're solitary, more solitary, so they don't really want to attack us, and they don't really stink, so they don't have a nest to protect. Um, but wasps aren't important predators in our system. So we don't see the larvae, but like bees, they are going to be that grubby looking um, <laughs> insect. Um, so females will bring insect prey back to their nest to feed their young. So. Um, and then you might see adults um, supplementing their, their diet with nectar. 
Um, and actually, they have similar nesting habits to bees, so some of them will nest below ground, some of them are stem nesting, if we don't think about the, the social wasps. And just to kind of highlight a, a few of the wasps, um, so one of the large ones that you'll see around um, are the spider wasp, so the tarantula hawk wasp is the state insect of New Mexico. Um, I have some shown here on a milkweed, um, as well as a smaller hawk, a, sp a smaller spider wasp down here. So these spiders, or these, these wasps hunt spiders, and they'll actually, um, so they sting the spider to incapacitate it, and then they'll bring it back to the nest still alive. They then lay an egg on that spider, which hatches, and then the larva eats the spider. So it's kind of an interesting, um, fascinating thing. And they, they just kind of paralyze it so that it will last for the larva to eat it. Um, but adults are common visitors on flowers because they eat nectar and pollen. Uh, another one that uh, we get a lot of questions about is uh, the cicada killer wasp. These are, are, can be very large wasps. They specialize in hunting cicadas, though, uh, which is why they're so large. The photo on the right here there just shows three different species, uh, the female and the male forms of the three species, uh, three of the species of cicada killers. And then I just thought this picture with one, uh, the one carrying a cicada was interesting. And um, they also dig large nests in the ground, so you might see big areas of soil um, that a cicada killer wasp laid or made. So these are, these are good ones to have around, um, and they are not the, not the, uh, the murder hornet in the news <laughs> that was in the news. Um, so if you see, I, I haven't really seen these, would be excited to see one. And then another wasp I wanted to highlight are the scoliad wasps. So these ones are actually mostly parasites of beetle larvae. Um, they look a little different. They also can be large, very colorful wasps. Some, like this one on the left, are a little more hairy. So they will also be digging the soil. Um, they also paralyze their prey and attach an egg to it. Um, so get, um, another kind of interesting behavior to have. And these will also be very common on flowers. So bees and wasps are related. They're in the same order. Uh, bees are actually, some people call them the vegetarian um, cousins of wasps because bees evolved from wasps. Um, but uh, I tried to pick two for these pictures that kind of look the same. So if you're wondering if it's a bee or a wasp, um, bees often have shorter and stouter legs, whereas wasps will have longer legs that are slender. They might have spines. Um, bees have those thick bodies, whereas wasps have long and thin ones. They have a narrow waist usually. And then bees have branch tears that they use for pollen collection. Wasps may be hairy, hairy sometimes, but they're generally not. And they won't hold pollen with those hairs if they are. So those are the large wasps. I also wanted to talk about some of the, the small wasps. So some of our parasitoid wasps. So with parasitoid wasps, there's two behaviors. Some are main behaviors. Some are endoparasites. So uh, the larvae are feeding and developing inside the host, so you won't necessarily know that that larva is um, inside there. Um, whereas others are ectoparasites, so those feed outside of the host. Um, with our parasitoid wasp, there can also be a variety of different hosts. There's thousands of different parasitoid wasp species. Um, adults, though, will feed on uh, nectar and honeydew, and kind of like the tachinid flies, they'll, they'll overwinter differently depending on species, but either within their host or outside. Um, and then this picture shows a parasitoid wasp getting ready to inject that cystinia caterpillar. So you might come across that. Um, and then just one of the largest of the wasp super families, so you might see these around, um, are the ichneumonid and braconid wasps. These are three picture, kind of three examples of those type of wasps. They often have very long antenna and slender waist. And if you, you can't really see the wings in these pictures, but compared to other small wasps, they'll have more complex wings on them. Um, this is the, the western giant ichneumonid wasp. I took this picture in the Sandias. 
It has maybe a frightening long ovipositor, two to four inches, but it doesn't want to sting us. It uses that ovipositor, um, so it hunts for horntail larvae and wood and then uses that ovipositor to, to lay its eggs inside the wood. So the larvae are parasitoids of horntail wasp larvae. Adults feed on nectar. And then I also pulled up two examples of the smaller wasps. So in the superfamily Chalcicoidea, um, on this butterfly milkweed on the top, you can kind of see a wasp hanging out on one of the flowers. So these are our smaller wasps. The bottom picture shows it under a microscope. Um, but these ones will often attack uh, butterfly and moth pupa, although others will parasitize uh, beetles or flies. And then some are actually secondary parasitoids of the ichneumonid wasp. So there's parasitoids that parasitize, par parasitize other parasitoids and it can get very complicated. I just took a class on wasps and they have like up to six levels of parasitism in some cases. Another an example of a very tiny one, so these ones you probably won't really see because this is under a microscope for that detail, um, but are the elophid wasps. Um, so these ones parasitize mites, spider eggs, beetles, caterpillars, flies, other hymenoptera as well. And many of these will parasitize leaf mining and wood boring, boring caterpillars of butterflies and moths and flies. So, yeah, like I said, lots of parasitoid wasps out there. I just picked a few that I thought were cool. Because they're so small, I just took two examples of how you might see there are parasitoids in the area. Um, so I'm sure you all know what galls are. Um, some gall-forming insects are parasitized by wasps, so if it's parasitized, that wasp will create a larger exit hole than the, uh, than the non-parasitized one. So um, that's what this picture shows. And then um, with the aphids, so the picture on the left shows a, 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 aphid parasit a parasitoid wasp that preys on aphids. picture on the right shows some oleander aphids. Um, if you see aphids that are swollen and kind of discolored, um, that means there's a parasitoid wasp developing inside of it, so you want to make sure to leave those. And those are actually called mummies. Sometimes you'll see a lot that are parasitized and not just this one with the two. So some steps that you can take to help to conserve our vast diversity of beneficial insects are first to just learn to distinguish the beneficial insects from, from the other ones. So that can just be from taking the time to watch to see what an insect does. Is it eating other insects or is it eating plants? Um, and then how much damage is it, is it giving? So that we're not, um, you know, we're not taking actions that will kill our beneficial insects. And then if you want to take next steps, we can look at um, providing habitat for our beneficial insects. So that can be by um, providing flowering resources. As I mentioned, a lot of them are feeding on pollen and, and nectar, so they need resources throughout the season. Um, you can also promote alternative prey and host. So maybe you have a, a predator that's going to eat. You have a target, a target insect in mind, um, but you need it feeding on other insects so that it's there. Um, when you're hosting, you know, so that there's, that the beneficial insects stay, stay there. Um, so that's that continuous food supply. And then also making sure we're protecting the, uh, the overwintering habitat. So that can mean leaving li leaf litter if it's possible, if there's not a pest problem, um, and just recognizing where they're at. We can also then um, kind of think of minimizing factors that might interfere with natural enemies, so that could be if you do have, you know, instead of if you're going to go prune, make sure that you're leaving areas that might have natural enemies developing, um, as well as tolerating some pest activity. So thinking about what your action threshold's going to be instead of just doing kind of a preventative treatment, you know, making sure that we're keeping plants healthy so that they can withstand some, some pest activity. And then also limiting chemical exposure um, of our beneficial insects. So with our beneficial insects, um, if you are going to use pesticides, just try to choose pesticides that are less toxic to those beneficial insects. So just doing some research before you apply. 
Uh, make sure you're not applying those pesticides when the flowers are in bloom, since, which I think is actually against the label anyways. Um, but avoid spraying when pollinators and natural enemies are, are active. So that could mean early, they're more active during the day. So spraying in the evening or in the morning. Um, and really making sure you're going out there and monitoring your, your insect activity before doing a, a pesticide application. And then with the temperature, some insects are more active um, at different temperatures. Also, minimizing spray drift. And then if there are honeybees present, um, it's recommended to contact the beekeeper before you apply so that they can take steps to um, mitigate any, any potential uh, interactions there. And then also avoid spraying habitat, um, like bee nesting areas where caterpillar host plants are and just where insects might be active outside of where your target area is. And then I also wanted to touch on trees since we are talking about trees here. So trees are very important insect habitats. Our, our, our flowering trees and even our wind pollinated trees help to provide uh, floral resources, especially earlier and later in the season. We, we don't have as many of the um, herbaceous flowering plants present. They're also really important as nesting, overwintering, and sheltering habitat for many of our, our insects. And because they have that greater density of floral resources, it helps the insects to be more efficient um, in gathering their pollen. Um, so I also pulled together some pictures um, from the, the fruit, one of the orchards that we have at, at Los Lunas at the Ag Science Center. So you could just see within the plant, you know, the row of trees there, we find so many insects flying around. So things like uh, yellow jackets, uh, there's a honeybee on the upper right here, the middle and the bottom show two other kinds of bees that are visiting. Um, also butterflies and moths will be active. So these trees are, are providing lots of important resources for our insects. We wanna make sure we're conserving those insects. Later in the season, things like, um, this is all from a baccarus that's outside of my office. Um, in the fall, it's just full of insects flying around. So again, we have different kinds of wasps visiting it, um, as well as different butterflies and bees. Um, so remember, most of them don't want to bother us. They're just trying to, trying to eat and take care of themselves. As I mentioned too, wind pollinated trees actually also provide important resources. Um, bees will actually still visit the flowers for pollen. Um, some bees will use, uh, will collect resin and sap from these trees and they'll help use them as glue to create the nest. And then these trees just provide a variety of important ecological services in our landscape. So a lot of uh, caterpillars and moths will use them as larval host, again, nesting sites, and then food resources for birds and mammals. To show just a small amount of data, in uh, 2021, we had honeybees out at five urban farms within Albuquerque. This uh, table shows, so we also, so we collected the pollen, we had it sent for DNA analysis. So this table just shows a summary of what species those honeybees were collecting trees, uh, pollen from in those areas throughout the whole time period. Uh, but I just wanted to point out that 20% of the pollen was collected from trees. Um, and actually most of it, um, the highest amount was from uh, lace bark elm, and that was especially true in October. Um, so it might not be something you think about as, as bees using. Unfortunately, if you look at the bottom, like kochia, and then also um, goat heads were on the list. So. <laughs> yeah, you'll see under as third. So something else to think about. And then uh, lastly, I just wanted to uh, pull up this table that the uh, National Wildlife Federation put together. So it's just um, keystone plants, so native plants that are critical for the food web um, and necessary for wildlife to complete their species. Um, so this is for our eco region, um, but just the, the list of, of some of the trees that are important host plants and shrubs important host plants for caterpillars and important host plants for specialist bees. So they are, you know, trees and shrubs are, are, as you know, very important in our landscape. So that's all I have. Um, here's contact info, but you can find it online. Um, and then here's my, my code. Oh, no. 
we do have time for some questions, and then I do have an important lunch announcement to make before you get up. So I'm making sure that we have time. Okay, questions? Yes. Insects? Yes, so I... Will you repeat the question? Uh, so the question was how last year's forest spiders may have impact, impacted pollinators and ground nesting bees. Um, I know a little bit from, I did prescribe, I studied prescribed fire and mowing for my masters, um, but not necessarily, not in forest settings. So it, do, it does depend on the severity of the fire. And I know there were some very high severe areas of the fire, um, but you know, a lot of times the, the heat of the ground doesn't go as low as where the insects are. Um, also with the severity, you know, it can help. I know more, the, I guess I know more the benefits. So I, I maybe not, doesn't really help your question, but fire can help with floral resources since it can help with that regrowth. Um, but I do know when it's, when it's a, a bad, and that large scale of a fire, it can be bad for insect populations. If we have smaller fires, they can move around. It helps promote that mosaic. Um, but I'm not as familiar with large scale wildfires. Thank you, Ms. Kirsten. Um, I have a question about scale and pinon um, and what kind of holistic approach can be had instead had of just them. cutting them all down. <laughs> and I'm looking at Victor. <laughs> um, I know you, um, well, that's where maybe I can more promote. Uh, we have a ins an IPM for insect pest of trees document that does have scale insects in it. There's a couple on the table outside, and if they're not there, I can get them for you. And it has, um, it has the four different IPM strategies and more holistic ways you can do that. Copy that. Thanks. <laughs> um, I have a comment about that question um, in that maybe part of the answer depends on if you're talking about somebody's backyard pinion or if you're talking about a whole, you know, That's, yes. uh, acres and acres of them, so there's different options. If it's a single tree or a couple trees, there are some things you can do, and there's information I think about that. Yes, that is more, that's true, yeah. that's more And then smaller. also that, um, one thing I keep hearing is what's, you know, that the, that for example, the, pin, the pinion needle scales killing our pinions, but that's not the case that necessarily, right? It's the climate crisis that is the problem, so keeping healthier trees is going to help us with that, so just not demonizing the pest as much, but anyway, okay, thanks. <laughs> Hello. Uh, so much has been made about um, the, uh, the systemic application of imidacloprid um, and its impact on pollinators. Uh, what would be that impact on the predatory insects that are perhaps feeding off of the, the, the chewing insects? And is, how is that working through the, uh, up through the uh, ecosystem? That's a very good question, and I am afraid I haven't done any reading on, on trophic level effects on the insect predators. Okay. But I will now. <laughs> Maybe next year. <laughs> next year, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Are, if you email me, I'll read about it tonight. <laughs> yeah, so the question is would more flowers in the landscape benefit the insects that are beneficial? And that, yes. So having. Um, Higher area and then higher diversity of flower species um, will usually bring in a higher diversity of the beneficial insects. So my question is about um, the preserving the like overwintering habitats because I work at a landscape company and people do not like to see leaves on the ground. In fact, we get a lot of complaints when we leave leaves on the ground. So what's the balance between you know, making people happy while keeping things clean, but also preserving good insects. But then the other part of it too is like sometimes leaving leaf litter, that's also a place to harbor the bad insects. So like, is there a good way to tell when is a good time to leave them? Or like, what's a good balance? Because you know, there's like funguses that overwinter and stuff. And I, I've always wondered like, you know, where, where the balance is with that. Yes, yeah, so it, and you're right, it is, it's all the balance. And then it's all just, you know, culturally we think clean landscapes are what we want to have. Um, so um, 
with leaving them, so recommend if someone, if someone has a pest problem and you know that they're in the leaves, then you should remove it. But if you don't have a pest problem, you know more leaving them. But you can also kind of create them into like more orderly piles to make them, I don't, make them look nicer. Um, there's actually a good talk. Doug Tallamy has a couple of really good talks about how to do promote uh, pollinator habitat that still kind of go into you know, what we view as organized landscapes. I know we have a, do you have a quick question? Um, I'm, I, yeah, I can go, maybe just ask go. it real quick and change <laughs> yeah. aside. Um, uh, yeah, any other recommendations for making oneself aware of what beneficials are in the landscape without just, given that most of us aren't entomologists on a tree, on a given tree, in a given part of the season? Yeah, so there's a lot of good resources out there. We do have some as, as an MSU extension that I can provide you. Um, uh, other resources, there's a book called a Garden Insects of, I, have to, I can't remember it offhand, but it's by Whitney Cranshaw. He was the entomologist in Colorado. It's very inexpensive. It's a wonderful book full of great pictures. It's like 400 pages of pictures of insects. I use that one frequently. Welcome. And I, I will be around the rest of today and tomorrow if you have any other questions. I have, I don't even know. I'm terrible on my pictures. I either use my, my iPhone, which is not the nice camera iPhone, or I do have a macro lens on something, a Nikon maybe. Yeah. Okay, I know we have more questions, and some of the questions from online were about leaf litter, so I think you covered those. Miranda will be around for lunch and through the, this afternoon, I think, to answer yes. more questions if you have specifics. The announcement that I have, I think, well, actually, I need to give you your special treat cookie as a thank you, oh. so I'll give that to you in just a okay. minute. <laughs> but we know we're ready to go to lunch, and so let's see. Okay, I have an announcement about the um, panel discussion tomorrow afternoon. We are really looking forward to your questions to add in. And so there's a couple different ways that we'll do that and um, more announcements on that this afternoon. And uh, the, the steel chainsaw sharpening demo that it says on your program is going to be outdoors during lunch. That's gonna start at 12.30 and be indoors right here in the lobby by their tent. So 12.30 steel demo on chainsaw sharpening. So that'll be a good one. And um, with that, yeah, the panel discussion, there's a, there, we'll, we'll give you more announcements about that this afternoon. So enjoy lunch and we'll see you back. <laughs>